and gentlemen, ladies of the house. You know, perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottaway suggesting, uh, challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, and Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. At the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. Staying with India, between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written minuted policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed, underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, let me take World War I as a, as a very concrete example since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suggested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One sixth of all the British forces that fought on the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded. Another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, and in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was in today's money, eight billion pounds. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse. Two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point, but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Now, we've heard other arguments on this side. There's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commission, has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. Uh, they, they were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand 
for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. <laughs> so taking all these factors into account, let me go to my own assessment of what good came of it for India and what bad came of it. First, the good. English language, at least 20 million Indians today now live in the former British colonies, including the United States. Any place that was ever a British colony is a place that speaks English today, and Indians, on account of learning English because of British colonization, have gone there, and most are very successful. In fact, Indian Americans are the most successful ethnic group in the United States based on household income, bar none. And all these Indians in all these other English-speaking countries they remit $90 billion a year back to India as of 2021. That is 3% of India's total GDP. That is just remittances. And I will expand on that point later in this video. The second benefit was a weakening of the caste system in India. The caste system was problematic for a number of reasons in that it created a fatalistic mindset. And if someone was born into a lower caste, they were told that they just could not aspire to any higher station in life. And the upper caste, the Brahmins, kept a lock on literacy and actually prevented lower castes from becoming literate. The British did a considerable amount to weaken this system and to blend it up a little bit more. And India therefore became a better place for non-Hindu minorities, which are 20% of India's population. And the British did not convert anyone to their religion, remember. Only 2% of India is Christian, and those are, for the most part, Catholic Christians. Those were converted by the Portuguese. There are very, very few Protestant Christians in India, and that is because the British were simply not interested in conversion of Indians to Protestant Christianity. The British were in it for the money and for the financial resources they could extract out of India. As bad as that may sound, there are other negative things they could have done but didn't do. And then the third benefit is, of course, related to that point. Had the Europeans that colonized India been either the French or the Portuguese, which were the other two major powers putting a lot of resources into an attempt to colonize India, India would have been a lot worse off. India would not have the English language, and there might have been a lot of other negative effects that were not present from British colonization. Those were the relatively good impacts, but now the negative impacts to follow. As you saw from the Shashi Tharoor video, there were quite a few negative impacts. One was resource extraction. India was 25% of the world's economy in 1750, but only 2% by 1947. And this coincided with the time frame of British colonization of India. There were a lot of British-induced famines, which you also saw from his video, and Winston Churchill quite deliberately and proudly ordered food away from India to feed troops during a World War II effort, and this led to three million Indians dying of starvation, something that he knew would happen beforehand, so this was a conscious decision on his part. And while diverting food away from people is not genocide, one could say it's incumbent on Indians to be adaptable enough to find another resource or to find some other way to mitigate that situation since they allowed themselves to even be in such a position that Winston Churchill could order food diverted away from India. He nonetheless did divert food away that he knew would cause millions of people to die of starvation. And Indians did have to fight in both world wars on behalf of the British Empire and were a substantial portion of British Empire forces in World War I and also to a lesser extent in World War II. This resulted in many tens of thousands of Indians getting killed as casualties of war. So these are the balanced good and bad points of people watching this video. Some will have extreme disagreement with the previous slide of the good impacts. Others will have extreme disagreement with this slide of the negative impacts. As I said at the start of this video, this debate is dominated by the fringes, 
and extremists. And I want a lot of them to come over here to the comments section and fight with each other to show how the extremists are very, very one-sided in both cases. And that's not a bad thing for traffic. I'm trying to take as fair and unbiased of a position as possible. But then this gets to the primary crux of the video. This state of India today, which is one that still has a substantial amount of deep poverty, despite some economic progress that India has had, to what extent is that still because of British resource extraction from India? Now, a lot of Indians will happily say that it will take generations upon generations for India to recover from the resources extracted from India by the British Empire. But I say that is absolutely not true. In 2021, India is now 74 years on from when the British left India. Even everything Shashi Tharoor said, take every factoid he said, but he's referring to events that occurred before 1947. What about after 1947? That's when no one was making India do things it didn't want to do. 74 years have passed. Why has India not progressed more than it has?